teaching after uh, Professor Drill this uh, class. Uh, I will talk about the three very important topics. Uh, I, 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 you know, I serve uh, Professor Drill's uh, handbook on, or lecture notes, and he were, I think he was talking about the general process of uh, membranes, and um, particularly focusing on the liquid separations and uh, process in, in intensifications. So I will focus on uh, starting with the history of membrane developments. Of course, he knew, you know, better than you know myself. But I think I was talk about the history of uh, reverse osmosis membrane development and the gas separation membrane developments uh, on this lecture note three, and I will talk about the uh, the uh, the membrane preparation, okay, in the lecture note four, and finally I will talk about the uh, gas separation which has not been touched by Professor Drioli extensively. And I also invited, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, mm, the Pushpenda Puri, Dr. Puri. Uh, Dr. Puri is from uh, America, and he has been a manager for almost 30 years at the very famous gas company called Air Products. And he retired about three year, two years ago, and we invited him about uh, you know about 15 months ago to give a lecture for a week, uh, and uh, the students are very uh, happy about uh, his lectures and uh, his experience at the industry will be very helpful for your uh, you know uh, the research on uh, many of the, uh, the membrane uh, the areas. So I invited him at the final week of May, final week of May, which is uh, I think May, May 24, 25th, in the week of 24, 25th. And we have uh, you know, three hour lecture, two three hour lectures on Wednesday and Friday, okay, starting from nine o'clock to about 12 o'clock. Okay, for two lectures, and uh, but we will combine uh, the uh, two lectures together as well. I have uh, I'm teaching the morning class just before this class on the polymer chemistry, so the undergraduate students along with you will attend those le the intensive lectures on particularly the gas separations. Okay, so this is the brief description of what we will do in the next uh, six or you know, five or six weeks. Okay, with, uh, let's start about the uh, history of membrane developments. I noted here as a RO, as a reverse osmosis, and the GS as a gas separation. And I am teaching at the Energy Engineering Department, and uh, I'm the editor of Journal Membrane Science, publishing you know, almost 300 20 papers in, in on membrane area, uh, so I uh, we can talk about the development of uh, the RO membrane and GS membrane. Okay, so I think you knew the uh, the first uh, reverse osmosis membrane uh, in perhaps in the textbook. Uh, the first reverse osmosis membrane was made by cellulose acetate. Okay, you have a cellulose structure. The three hydroxyl groups, and those three hydroxyl groups were replaced with the acetyl group, and that's called the cellulose acetate. The cellulose acetate was uh, uh, is is easily dissolved in acetone or THF solvents. So acetone dissolves this uh, cellulose acetate, and if you put your cellulose acetate solution in acetone, put it on top of your glass plate and evaporate your solvent, then your uh, film from, uh, the made of cellulose acetate will be formed. Okay? Those film is transparent. Okay? Now, transparent cellulose acetate film was the first reverse osmosis membrane. Uh, that was invented back in 1950s okay, by Wright and Breton. Okay? And this 
research was supported by the, uh, uni the, the Office of Saline Water in California in US uh, and they supported this research at the time you remember in the back in the 50s the, there is a two very uh, big research big science big research on water from seawater you, you have to obtain the water drinkable water from seawater and the second topic will be the space program okay? the uh, space program so there is a huge funds to support whether we can get the, uh, the water, drinkable water or industrial water from the seawater because uh, the whole earth is covered almost 70% or 80% is covered by the seawater. Okay? So there is a huge number of seawater but you cannot drink. And that's one of the uh, inspiration for the development of this reverse osmosis membrane. Of course, the concept has already been known, but first membrane was developed by this researcher at the Office of Saline Water. And they made a cellulose acetate thin film, which is about 5 to about 20 micrometer, okay? And they push the, uh, the seawater, which contains about 3.5 weight percent sodium chloride, okay? Or 35,000 ppm of uh, sodium chloride, push uh, the seawater about you know, 80 bar or uh, the 90 bar, which is about 1,000 PSI, okay? And they get the, uh, only the water, okay? Rejecting, rejecting 90% of uh, your CO, uh, the sodium chloride, okay? So rejection was about 98% of the sodium chloride, and you, you get the water only. And there was a very successful program. However, flux, was very low, okay? flux was very low. And that was the issue. And, uh, but anyway, cellulose acetate membrane is a candidate for reverse osmosis, and there was a, a great achievement of, at the time. Now, economically, it's not possible to make this cellulose acetate membrane as a reverse osmosis process because you have too, f too low flux to be economical. So later, uh, you know, researchers at the UCLA, uh, Loeb and Zori Rajan. Now, Loeb was a third year undergraduate student at chemical engineering of UCLA. And uh, Zori Rajan was a postdoc from India, okay? And they worked together and they thought that, well, this film, 20 micrometer in thickness, made of cellulose acetate, is good enough material, so they, they do not change this material, but, but they change the uh, preparation method. And they thought that the low flux is coming from the thickness. Okay? That was their assumption. So if they can decrease the effective thickness of this cellulose acetate from maybe 20 micrometer to below one micrometer, below one micrometer or you know, 300 nanometer, then perhaps they can get the uh, high flux, maintaining the high rejection. Okay? So that was their assumption. So what they have done in the laboratory, in the laboratory was that, okay, we have a cellulose acetate, and we have acetone, okay? And they put some additive in there, but the important point is that uh, you know, in this case, the first dense membrane was uh, formed after complete evaporation of your solvent, which is acetone. But they thought, what if we just evaporate acetone, maybe 10 seconds or 5 seconds, instead of 1 minute or 2 minutes, in case of uh, the right in Breton, uh, you know, they just uh, completed the uh, evaporated the uh, acetone, but what if we just uh, stop the evaporation of the solvent after 10 seconds and then put it into the, uh, uh, the water, which is a non-solvent for uh, uh, the cellulose acetate. Okay. If you think about, if you think about just, you know, ten, after 10 seconds, they just put it into water, what they have obtained was one micrometer thickness of the skin layer on the top 
and the rest of them are made of a porous membrane, porous support, which is called osmotic structure. Okay, osmotic structure. When they decrease the effective thickness of this, you know, dense skin layer below one micrometer, their flux is more than 10 times higher because of the lower, you know, resistance to uh, the, the, you know, transport. Uh, the, the porous substructure is not acting as a barrier or, or is not acting as a uh, you know, resistant layer because you have a very porous la layers and is, uh, is just a mechanical support. And they, they, the assumption was correct and they maintained their resistance, I mean, excuse me, the rejection, which is above 98%. And this invention back in 19... Uh, 62 was the evolution, the revolution, actually the revolution of the uh, reverse osmosis market. Okay, okay? and these two events, Wright and Breton, Cerrosa State Dense Membrane, was the first uh, discovery about the possibility of making the reverse osmosis membrane and uh, industrially, uh, industrially. Uh, the, uh, the great achievement is coming from Loeb and Sir Rajan's discovery on osmotic membrane structure. Still, cerros acetate membrane, after what, uh, 50 years, still the cerros acetate membrane is used as a reverse osmosis membrane. Okay. Now, so the very important aspect is that you have to have a very thin skin layer to get the high flux. The rejection is coming from material itself. You have to choose the right material for right rejection. Flux or pomions or whatever came, came from very you know, thin layer of your skins. Okay. And substructure is important. The substructure is from uh, the porous, you know, the structures of, uh, of the pollen membranes. So this Loeb and Suri Rajan, uh, you know, they precipitate polymer after some time of evaporations. Uh, Loeb uh, passed away about uh, five years ago, uh, whereas, uh, you know, I think he served as uh, many consultant and many, you know, he came back to uh, Israel uh, and uh, served as a researcher there as well. Sori Rajan was uh, moving to Canada and he served as a researcher at, uh, at the National Research Council where Professor Guyver is working right now in Ottawa, Canada. And he retired in 1986 and I attended his retirement ceremony, retirement symposium, and he's still alive. I think he's about 96 or so. Anyway, this in two invention was very you know, important developments in the history of reverse osmosis. After this invention from uh, Loeb and Suri Rajan, there are many companies producing, uh, produces the uh, reverse osmosis membrane, uh, such as uh, Osmonix, uh, you know, some Monix, some, you know, reverse osmosis, or Monix. <laughs> uh, there are many companies uh, naming the, uh, the, these developments. Uh, and and mimicking this osmotic structure is from the cathode, okay, cathode. And they found that osmotic membrane is very important, right? Osmotic membrane. But what if, what if we have uh, two different materials? No, this second membrane is from the same material with a, with osmotic structure, okay? But what if we have uh, one material forming the thin layer of a uh, dense the, the, the uh, rejecting layer, and the second layer is a porous layer, porous layer from the second polymer. And, uh, and the cathode at the time, uh, working at Nostar Company in Minnesota, and the later it became the film tech, and right now it's, uh, it's acquired by Dow Chemical. Uh, the cathode made the uh, asymmetric membrane from two different polymer, okay? The, the support polymer is made from the polysulfone 
And a thin layer is from polyamide, from interfacial polymerization. I think I showed you what is the interfacial polymerization, okay? And I think we are working on the interfacial polymerization uh, uh, using the, uh, the, uh, the amide, uh, amide uh, the concept. And uh, they have done the thin film composite of symmetric membrane from polyamide layer on the top, polysophone on the, on the bottom. And this concept uh, is right now uh, industrialized or commercially available from the companies. So uh, in, making the hollow, uh, in making the reverse osmosis, we still have a second conventional cellulose acetate, the, uh, the polymer for uh, reverse osmosis. And more common is the third membrane, thin film composite, or TFC, TFC asymmetric membrane from this MI chemistry. And right, right now here in Korea, we have a company, Bungjin, is producing uh, this uh, TFC composite membrane and making a spider wand modules. So this is a very brief history of, uh, of the development of uh, reverse osmosis. And, uh, and uh, you should not be, and I cannot, uh, I cannot forget about this uh, historical development. Okay, uh, so later, uh, after uh, you know, 60s, mid 60s, there is a huge number of uh, huge number of uh, you know, polymers or uh, membranes in the form of hollow fiber or in the form of flash sheet are developed. So in reverse osmosis, this is the chronological chart of the aural membrane. And this highlights the commercialization of all the membrane developed and so far developed uh, until the late uh, 70s okay? uh, or uh, late 80s. Uh, I think, you know, the development during the 60s and 70s are uh, prevailing the market right now, although there are some improvements, okay? The basic chemistry and basic forms of the reverse osmosis membranes are not changed so far, has not been changed so far. Okay. Now, the first development by the uh, cellulose acetate membrane by Loeb and Suri Rajan was extended and they made the cellulose acetate thin film composite concept and they put the you know, cellulose acetate on top, or excuse me, the polyamide on top of polysulfones and they changed the monomers, which I will show you a little bit, you know, the chemistry later in the in, in the next chart, next the slides, but they changed the names NS100, NS200, NS300, and FD30. And I think you, uh, you probably uh, will be familiar with FD30 instead of NS series. Okay? And NS means North, North Star. Okay? That's the name of the company, North Star Company. And, uh, and they changed the name to Film Tech, and that's why they put FD. FT30 is quite common. And later, this chemistry will be uh, extended to other series of polymers in, uh, in the company called UOP, American company, Dore, and Nitodenko, and so on. Okay. So those are, and they are making you know, thin film composite membrane made of polyamide on top of the polysulfones. Uh, okay, this is the serous acetate or a thin film com composite. You know, you can make a spider wand module. Oh, excuse me. You can make a spider wand module out of this flesh membrane. Okay, if you can make a thin film serous acetate, you can you can make a wi winding up of the modules, or you can coat the polysulfone with the polyamide. Okay, and and wind it. Uh, and making a spiral one modules. Now, in the other side, in the other side, DuPont at the same time with the uh, uh, with the uh, cathode, they realized that well, DuPont first introduced the interfacial polymerization. In fact, in the fifties, as uh, other you know novel polymers have been uh, you know uh, produced. Uh, by DuPont. 
So DuPont try to make the uh, try to make a nylon not in the form of the flesh sheet, but in the form of hollow fibers. They try to make hollow fiber from nylon. They try to make a hollow fiber from aramid. Aramid is uh, aromatic polyamide, okay, which is much uh, thermally resistant and chemical resistant because of the presence of the uh, aromatic rings in, the, in, in, in polymeric structure. So they st started to make hollow fibers, and these are the development of hollow fiber auto membranes. Okay? And uh, you can make a fiber and put it into uh, the tube and make a hollow fiber membrane module. And this module, hollow fiber membrane module, can be a very compact system, and the, uh, the, uh, the you know, volume to area ratio is, uh, is, is very, very high, uh, so that uh, you know, this hollow fiber membrane is much more uh, compact than the spider one module. And you will see that uh, you, know, you can make about maybe 5% of the uh, volume of the spider wound membrane module uh, can be made from the hollow fiber membrane modules. So it's about uh, 20 times larger space is necessary to make this spider one module, whereas you can have only about 5% of the spider one module. So if you look at this uh, series, B9, aramid hollow fiber, B10, aramid hollow fiber by DuPont, and later, you know, Dow Chemical started to make the cell as a triastate membrane. Okay. Now, what they have done was that, uh, well, if you take a look at this discovery of uh, low ebb and cell erosion, okay, uh, low ebb made a, a symmetric membrane, a symmetric flashing membranes. If you can make a hollow fiber following this concept of DuPont, okay, from the same material, which is much cheaper than uh, aramid, well, we can make a, they can make a very uh, economic uh, hollow fibers. So they try to develop the uh, cellulose acetate hollow fiber systems, but it's very difficult okay, because you have to have a very neat structures. And Doyobor, with the same concept, they started to put their research efforts, R&D efforts, to CT hollow fibers uh, and, and so on. So, so far, so far in the aro membrane market, uh, we have uh, two very important materials, serous acetate and polyamide, TFC membrane, spider wound and hollow fibers. Spider wound is made from both of these two. Hollow fiber is made from uh, the aramid or serous triastate. But this aramid project was gone because of the, uh, the, because of the uh, material uh, cost. This is much expensive than the uh, cost of the making the serous triastate. So uh, we have a very limited number of uh, polymers for RO. We have a very limited number of uh, configurations, spider wound and uh, hollow fiber systems. Cellulose triacetate is, uh, is good in terms of the cost, but it's bad in terms of the chemical attack. Chemical attack, uh, you know, particularly the bacterial effect, uh, is very, uh, very weak. The, uh, the interfacial polymerization, you know, FD30 membrane where polyamide is good uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, making economical the polymerization technique and easy techniques, uh, but uh, it's not good in terms of the uh, chemical attack as well because MI group, C and N group could be cleaved due to the uh, cleaning uh, agents, where sodium hypochlorite was very widely used in the RO or RO membrane system, so that uh, we have to think about, uh, and they have to uh, the, the modify the, the chemistry a little bit uh, 
because of the chemical attack from these cleaning agents. Anyway, this is the chronological chart of the outer membrane. And, uh, and I think uh, you can take a look at the classification of the commercial outer membrane by the general chemical types. We have uh, fully aromatic polyamide in, in the form of the, uh, the hollow fiber or spider wand or tu tubular. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, developer. We have uh, aryl alkyl polyamide containing polyurea. We have acetyl acetate, triacetate, and we have a polyacrylonitrile. Polyimidazolone is a new, new polymer developed by Teijin in Japan, and, but I don't think it, this is uh, uh, commercially available. Uh, polypiperazine amide is, uh, is, uh, is good, good uh, polymer because it does not contain the aromatic ring, but it contains a hexa uh, methyl group, cyclohexyl group containing polymer, so that will be much easier to make. And uh, this, uh, I think this uh, was already been commercialized by the film tech, now uh, Dow Chemical, Nitodenko and Torres. So phonated polymers were uh, uh, used at the time because if you wanted to make a hydrophilic poly, uh, the reverse osmosis membrane, uh, you need to sulfonate them. But uh, the chemistry making this a sulfonated polymer, hydrophilic sulfonated polymer, was done by post-treatment. In other words, you first make a polyfuran or polysulfon, uh, okay? and then treat, treat it into uh, sulfuric acid that, uh, after making the membrane, and that's the post-treatment systems. This way, you can make a, a hydrophilic membrane, but the problem is that reproducibility of making this post-treated post sulfonated polymer is not great. So later, in, uh, you know, uh, you know, after 20 years, uh, the group in the uh, McRath and uh, the Benny Freeman was working on this uh, pre-made, pre-sulfonated polymer rather than post-sulfonated polymer uh, was used for uh, potential uh, water applications. But reverse osmosis membrane was not fabricated uh, so far by uh, the, uh, the sulfonated polymer for uh, reverse osmosis because of the low rejection. Okay? The rejection current development in the rejection uh, for our row is, uh, is almost 99.99, okay? Whereas uh, sulfonated so polymer is not meeting that, uh, that criteria. Okay, this is the brief uh, the chemistry of uh, NS series membrane, okay? NS series membrane. What they've done was they used a polyimine, polyethylene imine, Reacting with uh, you know TDI tolylene diisocyanate, which is the monomer for making uh, uh, polyurethane, or you can make the uh, diacid chloride, uh, methylene, uh, you know the containing uh, you know uh, the meta mm, phthalic acid containing you know acid chloride, uh, so that you can make a cross-linking system because you have uh, several. Uh, sites for uh, reaction. You can make an amide here, where you have many active hydrogens, so you have a cross-linking systems. Uh, using the first chemistry, you can have NS100 series, whereas you have uh, urea. So th this is why what they call is urea, polyaryl alkyl urea system. Polyaryl, polyallyl, uh, alkyl, and urea system. This is the first system. And this is the very uh, the fast reaction system, but you have to be very careful about the presence of water because these two chemicals are very you know, prone to uh, you know water attack. And this is the modified polymer NS101 and PA100. Okay. Uh, next, the composite membrane was prepared. Uh, the uh, you can ever. You can have this chemistry. You can have a very support layer, which is made of microporous polysulfon. And uh, first, you have a first bath containing polyethylene imine, 
okay, and nip them, and uh, and put the uh, put, put and and then uh, the, the uh, TDI toluene diisocyanate, which contains NCO groups, will be added together to make a thin film, thin uh, in a polymer layer, and if you washed out, then uh, you 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 can crosslink them after heating, and this is the chemistry. Uh, making the thin film composite membrane made of, uh, made of uh, you know, polyamide chemistry or polyurea chemistry using interfacial polymerization uh, concept. And these are the uh, you know, name of uh, the, uh, the polymer membrane that was developed by various the manufacturers or research groups at the time in, back in the 60s and 70s. After 30, and DuPont's uh, B10 was uh, finally successful. Uh, and uh, this membrane uh, has uh, chemistry, something like this. This is very similar to each other. The difference between the uh, film tax FT30 and DuPont's B10 is, uh, is the presence of this, uh, the, uh, the carboxylic acid group containing monomer or sulfonic acid containing monomer. Okay. So uh, that's the difference. But this DuPont's B10 was not su commercially successful. Uh, but the film tax FD30 was commercially uh, successful uh, uh, at the time. And what, what you can see is that uh, you have a, you have a you know, non oven fabric. And on top of the non oven fabric, you coat the polysulfone ultra filtration membrane. And uh, using the uh, process that I've just described, uh, you can make a cross-linked aromatic polyamide membrane uh, on top of these polysulfones. And right now, the skin thickness is, uh, is less than one micrometer, okay? And, uh, and uh, the surface layer is not very uh, smooth, but it's you, have a, you have a turbulent floor Okay, so that you will, you will uh, have an effect increasing your uh, surface areas. And that way you can increase the flux because of the uh, increased uh, surface area system. Okay. Okay, this is the brief history of, uh, of uh, the research development in, uh, in the reverse osmosis membrane system. And I will just br briefly introduce you about the category of the membrane processes. Uh, the membrane processes could be uh, due to the two main groups, porous membrane and the non-porous membranes. If you have a porous membranes, then uh, what is the size of the pores? What are the size of, uh, uh, what, are, what is the shape of your pores as well as the shape of your penetrants? What are the charge that you have uh, species and so on? If you, if you do not have any uh, porous, por uh, porous structure in your membrane system, then uh, you can have a diffusion. You can have a selective absorption as well. Okay? So we have a porous membrane system and non-porous membrane systems. In the case of uh, outer membrane, you have a non-porous layer on the top, whereas a porous layer on the bottom. So we have a combination of uh, these two, but non-porous Membrane system is very important, of course, in the case of RO membrane. I forgot to uh, put the size of your uh, sodium chloride and water versus the, uh, the porosity of uh, pore size of uh, RO membrane. But briefly, uh, RO membrane, the, you know, uh, produced by both acetyl acetate and uh, polyamide, has around 5.5 uh, to about 7. Armstrong in pore sizes, okay, 5.5 to about 7 Armstrong in pore sizes on the, on the skin layer. Uh, but water, if you look at the kinetic diameter of the water, is about 2.9 Armstrong if it's a single molecule. If it's clustered, of course, if, if it does have a cluster system, of course the size of cluster of water is different from 2.9 Armstrong. Of course, it's a little larger. What about the, uh, the size of the sodium chloride in the seawater? Size of the single sodium ion and chloride ion 
will range from around 7 Armstrong to about, uh, about uh, uh, 8 Armstrong if it's hydrated. So if you have a 5.5 Armstrong membrane, you can separate the water, you can pass the water through the membrane, whereas you reject the sodium chloride. So that's the, uh, that has not been known at the time of the development, the 60s and 70s, but with the uh, uh, advancement of a characterization method using positron analysis method, we were uh, able to characterize the pore size of the uh, outer membrane and, and others. Okay, so I think I will uh, take a look at the you know, pore, pore size using poles later, but, but I think you will know that the size of the, uh, the solute and size of the membrane particularly the pore, is very important. And uh, reverse osmosis membrane has a very small size. Nanofiltration has a little bit larger one, ultrafiltration and microfiltration, so that you can discriminate the, uh, the molecules of, uh, the, of, uh, from, uh, for the penetration. Uh, osmo osmonics osmonics uh, was uh, found by uh, uh, found by the, the businessman in back in uh, the 60s and he followed the uh, uh, Loeb and Sori Rajan's technology and they, make, they can make the, uh, the membrane and systems but right now I think they sold this company uh, and this was the, the venture company producing the reverse osmosis membrane and they made this chart, which is very, uh, 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 very uh, the common at the time, but right now I think you can make it everything, depending upon the size of the, uh, size of the material uh, uh, versus the uh, process for membranes. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can separate, for example, virus using the uh, ultrafiltration membrane, uh, and microfilter will uh, you know, separate the, uh, the pigments or bacteria. You can separate the, uh, of the water from seawater. You can separate the metal ions from uh, the water uh, using nanofiltration membranes. So using this chart, you can separate uh, many of the substances from, uh, from mixtures. So membrane processes are done by many of the uh, separation mechanisms. And I think you have already touched upon about the liquid separation. Uh, and I will talk about the uh, gas separation. I think you also uh, have touched about the membrane crystallization, membrane distillation very extensively. So I will not touch about the, the topics. Uh, we have a, a type of the filtration we have a dead end filtration or cross flow filtration. Uh, dead end filtration is very common in the laboratory. If you wanted to separate uh, some mixtures, uh, when you synthesize some materials, you can use the filtration media. But uh, in the membrane industrial process, uh, the cross flow filtration is very common. And cross flow filtration will reduce the fouling uh, or the accumulation of your uh, the uh, foulants or contaminants on the surface of the membrane. We have a symmetric structure and a symmetric structure. We already talked about these uh, structures. We also talked about the, uh, the configuration of the membrane, whether it's a flesh sheet or a hollow fiber. And I have a tubular membrane here, and tubular membrane has a larger diameter than hollow fibers. Usually, the uh, criterion for uh, dis discriminating tubular versus the hollow fiber is about, uh, you know, is about maybe about one millimeter in diameter. So if you have a membrane with the outer diameter less than about one millimeter, saying that 600, uh, 800 micrometer in outer diameter, then it's called the hollow fiber. If it's maybe several, mit several millimeters, Okay, then we call that as a tubular membrane. 
you have uh, metals, materials from organic, inorganic, and hybrid. Uh, organic materials are quite prevailing right now, but inorganic membranes uh, have uh, advantages, although it's very expensive. Okay? We have a metal membrane, uh, such as a palladium membrane. We have uh, nickel membranes, and they have their own advantages as well, although uh, it's difficult to fabricate compared with organic polymers. Charges will influence the separation uh, of the membranes as well. You can make a, a finger type of, uh, of the asymmetric membrane as well. You have a dense skin layer and porous layer. This is what they call the finger-like pore structures. You have uh, some type of fingers. Uh, fingers are forming from uh, the polymer solution with a low concentration, okay, and this, uh, when you put your, uh, when you put your, f you know, polymer solution on top of glass plate, after some period of evaporation time, if you put it into the water, then what happens is that the water will go into the uh, polymer solution and replacing the solvent with a non-solvent, which is water. And that way, your solvent will be moved, gathered together, and moved to, uh, toward the outside. That's why you form the, uh, the porous structure, whereas the polymer will be combined together because of the, uh, because of a uh, uh, ternary, ternary phase diagram, okay? So we will talk about the ternary phase diagram in order to make the uh, polymer membrane with a finger structure or a polymer membrane with the sponge structures. Okay, following which line in the ternary phase diagram will determine your porous structures. So we'll talk about this anyway. Uh, I think we have already talked about this uh, composite membrane. We have, a if, we, if I have a cellulose acetate, then I have a you know, very fine layer, and on, on the bottom we have a supporting layers. With this chemistry, mimicking this chemistry, uh, they can make a polyamide with the similar structures and can make a thin film composite membrane out of this polyamide. Configuration of the mo module is very important. We have a hollow fiber membrane system. We have a spider one module. We have a tubular membrane module with a, with a big diameter of the tubes. We can have a plate and frame type of module, meaning that we have a you know, sheet of, of sheet of uh, membrane, sheet of membrane here, and uh, between the sheet of the membranes, we have a support layer. So you, if you stack together, okay, and put it into uh, one big chamber, that's called the plate and frame type of modules. It's not very common in other uh, separation modules, but if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, uh, mm, Rochem, Rochem, R O C H E M, produced this frame type module for a microfilter. And in, in the case of pulp evaporation membrane, they use uh, the plate and frame type of membrane modules. Uh, otherwise, spider wound and the hollow fiber membrane modules are very common. Uh, you know, flesh sheet membrane is wound together. We have a, uh, we have a, uh, we have a membrane, and below, uh, between this membrane, we put, this, we put the support layer, okay? In many cases, the support layer is, uh, is a mesh, is a, is a mesh, uh, and this mesh was, uh, was uh, the size of the mesh is very important, and the material is very important as well. And, uh, and, and you, you can make a glue with the two layers of membranes, and in between this membrane, you have, uh, of course, a support layer. And uh, they can, ma they can the make a glue with these two membranes together. And this is called the one envelope. One envelope. This, if, you, if you pack up many envelopes and make a, you know, you know wound together uh, and cut it, make a, you know, spiral wound out of membrane modules. Uh, 
Hollow fiber membrane system is quite common. We can make a hollow fiber, of course, for uh, ultrafiltration. Uh, we can make a hollow fiber for uh, microfiltration. We can even can make a hollow fiber for gas separations. Hollow fiber system is very, uh, uh, very uh, convenient because you don't need a uh, complicated wounding steps in the uh, spiral wound modules. Okay. So we will talk about this hollow fiber preparation as well in the future. Uh, hollow fiber membrane system or, uh, or capillary membrane system is piled together. So you can, you can put many modules together, uh, make a linear big cube, okay? So that uh, you can extend this to, uh, to a big systems. Uh, okay, so that's the brief history about the development of a reverse osmosis membrane. And I'll talk from now on about the development of uh, gas separation membranes. Now, if you remember uh, the history of uh, Wright and Breton and, uh, and uh, Roeb and Sorry Rajan's chemistry and Cadot's chemistry, uh, the gas separation membrane has been studied by many researchers, such as the Graham's. Graham's diffusion law and uh, Bearer made a contribution to the uh, permeability measurement. So we use the Bearer units, okay? Bearer, B A R R E R, Bearer units. And you knew that the uh, reverse osmosis membrane was uh, developed during the 60s and 70s. And this accelerated the uh, development of gas separation membranes. Okay, now gas, uh, gas molecule such as uh, oxygen and nitrogen is much smaller than the ion uh, size. The ion, size of the ions are, I said, if it's hydrated, then it's about six Armstrong, eight, seven Armstrong, and eight Armstrong. So the reverse osmosis membrane has a pore size around 5.5 to about six or seven Armstrongs. But gas molecules, are much smaller. Most of the gas molecules that we are, you know, uh, talking about, such as oxygen molecule, CO2, and uh, helium, hydrogen, or methanes, are in the range of three to about four Armstrongs. For example, oxygen has a kinetic diameter of uh, 3.46 Armstrong, whereas uh, nitrogen is six, uh, 3.64. Okay, it's only about 5% difference. CO2 is about 3.3 Armstrong, and nitrogen is 3.64, so it's about 10% difference. It's very difficult to separate the oxygen and nitrogen uh, using the polymer membrane, particularly from the reverse osmosis membrane. They, of course, they have tried, okay, but there is no separation. You can have a very high flux, but no selective separations. Selectivity is very important, uh, meaning that you have only one component from a bi binary mixture passing through the membrane. But if you have a, if you have a binary feed mixture and, uh, and uh, two components will pass with uh, almost the same rate, then the selectivity is one. No separation. Okay. So anyway, uh, they try to make the uh, gas separation membrane for, uh, by using the uh, chemistry of, uh, and the development of uh, RO membranes. Now, around 1980s, 1980, researchers at uh, Monsanto at the time, but right now air products, okay? Uh, because Monsanto developed, but these people I mean, uh, you know, this Monsanto was acquired by the Air Products in 1990. So 10 years later, this division was sold in by Air Products. So anyway, this researcher, Hennis and Tripod, developed the gas separation, first gas separation membranes. And with this development, they can make advanced membrane materials done by Ube in Japan using polyimide and by DuPont and Dow Chemical. And there is a big development later on in this case. 
these are the uh, uh, commercial development. Uh, and and uh, with, with this development in 1980s, there is a huge number of other membranes. Okay? Dow Chemical first uses the uh, general. This is the cellulose acetate by the uh, Grace Company or Cyanara and Separex. And also for uh, natural gas separation. And the hollow fiber membrane was developed in 1990s from polyimide, uh, particularly from the uh, Ube Company and uh, some companies in, uh, in, in America as well. So gas separation membrane, first gas separation membrane uh, was developed by Monsanto, and I would like to talk a little bit about this the chemistry uh, a few slides later, I guess. So if, you if I have a non-porous membrane, which is dense membrane, just in the case of, uh, just in the case of cellulose acetate, dense membrane, or if I have a very dense membrane, dense skin layer, we can expect solution diffusion model. But if I have a pores, and depending upon the pore sizes, okay, I, I may have a surface diffusion, I may have a Neusen diffusion, or I may have a convective diffusion, convective flow, convection. Okay. So uh, you know, size of this pore is very important determining your mechanism of your uh, transport. Usually, Neusen diffusion uh, is from the uh, several nanometer or several tens of armstrongs. Surface diffusion is around, occurs around the one nanometer in size of the pores. Dense membrane has, you know, less than one nanometer of the uh, or ten armstrong, one the less than ten armstrong of the uh, the pore sizes. Now, we do not regard this membrane as a, as a porous membrane because your pore size is too small to uh, tell that this is the porous structure. So, uh, you know, back in 1960s and 70s, uh, the Sori Rajan okay, and Matsura, uh, Sori Rajan hired the Matsura, Professor Matsura, uh, as a postdoc, and uh, they worked together to develop the porous membrane model, model for reverse osmosis. In other words, uh, Sori Rajan tried to develop some model, mathematical model, to describe their high flux membrane with a very high rejection by using, by assuming that this membrane has a pores, okay? Of course, this is pore is very small. We don't know yet what is the size of the pores at that time, back in the 70s. But, uh, but, but they have uh, elaborated very extensively in mathematically. And I looked at that literature published in Journal of American, uh, Journal of uh, Applied Polymer Science, back in the 70s, 74, 75, 76, when I was a graduate student, just like you. Uh, in 77 and 78. And I looked at the literature and it was very difficult. And the one paper might be about 40, pa 40 pages. And they assumed that they, uh, this outer membrane has a pores. So they, have, uh, they developed a pores, porous membrane. Later, when I studied the US and talked about these membranes, and I learned that the Sori Rajan and uh, the, uh, the Matsura was not uh, accepted at the time by many membrane community. Okay? In other words, their porous membrane model was not accepted okay, by the group from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Loeb's and colleagues. And these people were talking about the, uh, the universal thermodynamic model and other models uh, were developed at the time and uh, this group of people block the publication of this porous membrane model, uh, model in general membrane science. <laughs> so they have never published the article in general membrane science using this porous membrane concept. But anyway, uh, right now I think uh, you know, I can clearly see that there should have been a, uh, some type of pores. Okay? Anyway, we can re really define the size of the pores anyway. 
And the size of this hole is much smaller than this molecular sieving concept as well. Uh, Monsanto first made the, uh, the prism membrane. Right now, this Monsanto was acquired by Air Products, and this picture was uh, taken from Richard Baker's textbook on principles of membrane science and technology in page uh, 313. What it is is that you have a porous polysulfur membrane. Okay? So we, they, they make a uh, polysulfone or symmetric membrane for gas separation purpose, but they cannot achieve the, uh, the high uh, the selectivity. Okay? Selectivity of this polysulfone membrane, if it's a dense membrane, then they, they can achieve hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen separation factor around, around five. But if they can make a, a symmetric membrane, they never achieve the selectivity around five. So what happened? So the, they were you know, thinking re and rethinking about this w what happened. And what happened was that they may have a little bit of defect, a little bit of defect, small pinholes okay, in, in this uh, skin layer. So they tried to uh, cover this defect with the uh, silicon rubber. Silicon rubber. Uh, it's not selective layer, but silicon rubber uh, is, uh, is very permeable layer. But this, if they cover this, uh, the uh, silicon, thin layer of silicones, the, what happens is that they can block these skins, uh, block these defects. Okay? So uh, they can mimic the uh, Loeb and Sorirajan membrane concept, but by changing the uh, you know, second layer uh, from this thin skin layers concept, they can achieve the uh, same selectivity as the original ones by covering the, this defect. So what, what they have done was that they can make a you know, hollow fiber of polysulfones, okay, hollow fiber polysulfones with a little bit of defects. And if they put and soak this, uh, the this polysulfone with the defects, hollow fibers, into the solution of uh, PDMS containing, containing hydrocarbon you know, solvents, such as uh, hexane. Okay? And this hexane is, uh, is, is uh, evaporated. So what leaves is the, only the silicon layer, silicon rubber layer, covering the defects, obtaining the high selectivity, the original selectivity. And, uh, and, and this way, this way they can make a commercially available the air separation membranes. Okay, and, uh, and you can you can also make the selective layer on the top or porous layer on the bottom by using the uh, interfacial polymerization concept as well. Anyway, uh, using this concept, they can make a nitrogen separation units. This nitrogen separation units. Uh, is not versatile in every uh, uh, processes, but it, it can be competing with other processes. If you look at the other pages, figure 8.227 in, in the second edition, membrane can be utilized in some area, but the membrane is uh, competing with the cryogenic process or PSA pressure swing adsorption process. Uh, the membranes are used in some areas uh, in making the nitrogen production. Nitrogen production is important because you can, you can, uh, mm, excuse me, nitrogen production is important. Uh, let me see. Uh, nitrogen production is important because if you put the prism membrane module here, okay, and when the air is coming in, you can, oxygen is a little smaller gas than nitrogen, so nitrogen is just a passive through, whereas the oxygen is enriching. Okay? So this way, you can make a 99.99% nitrogen from the air, so that this nitrogen will be uh, 
purging to uh, the fuel tank. So after some time, this fuel tank will be uh, uh, inotted with the nitrogens. This nitrogen gas is inert gas, so that the, uh, it will be filled in the empty spaces of fuel tank after some consumption of the, uh, the fuels. So the, if, even if there is a, a oil vapor coming from your, uh, you know, the fuel tank, uh, you do not have any explosion. In fact, in 1998, uh, in 1998, uh, the airplane from United States to Europe, uh, there was an explosion because of the uh, oil vapor coming from your fuel, fuel tank, and everybody was killed, just like the uh, big uh, disaster that we have uh, last week uh, in, in, the, in the ship. So uh, everybody was killed, and at that, from that time, uh, the every airplane passing the United States should have this nitrogen purging system. Okay, most of them, of course, are 100% is coming from membrane. If it's not a membrane, of course, if the uh, you know other process like a PSA or a cryogenic process will not be available because you need the very compact systems. So, for example, if it's a C45, you know, big. Uh, the biggest uh, uh, you know, transporting airplane has, I heard that it has about 40, 40 modules with about one meter size in length with about uh, 10 inches of the, of the outer diameter. Of course, this module is covered with the, uh, with the aluminums or metals. So if you think about 40 module, weight is enormous. Okay, so if you have an innovative membrane, innovative membrane with a smaller membrane area, in other words, if you have a high permeability, same selectivity with a, with a very high flux, then you can reduce the number of modules. And this way, uh, they try to make the, uh, the membrane module out of our technology. That's why they, they took the licensing from, from Hanyang University. So this is a uh, real inoting, onboard inert gas separation, or called the OBIX, okay, OBIX. Uh, and uh, using this membrane concept, I think you can utilize this membrane modules. These are the, uh, the big, you know, drum is a membrane module to separate the uh, carbon dioxide from, from your natural gas. Okay. Uh, this is called the platform. Platform, platform. Uh, the cost of this building platform uh, will be around uh, two to five billion dollars. And uh, the, you know, you know, some portion of this platform is made from membrane modules. Okay, and membranes are sometimes, you know, this one platform and this is membrane module. This is one membrane modules, and you have uh, many, 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 you know, number of modules in the platform for separating the uh, carbon dioxide from natural gas. If you look at the, the if you look at the uh, size of the the modules, you can appreciate that uh, the size of the module from a uh, spider one module, okay, is is very large, whereas uh, hollow five membrane module. It's much smaller. So you, so you can make a small size of the membrane module from hollow fiber rather than SPIRA-1 modules. SPIRA-1 module right now is made from a UOP using the serous acetate. So serous acetate is coated on top of polysulfones and make a SPIRA-1 module, okay, for gas separation, natural gas separation. Whereas you can make a uh, you know, hollow fiber from cellulose acetate or from the uh, polyimide or many of the other polymers. So this, this huge membrane module compared with huge membrane modules, <laughs> look at this, this is the size of the man. This is the size of man here. 
Okay. So if you go back to uh, what, we, okay. So this is, uh, so we, we can have a membrane processes for gas separation competing with the cryogenic processes. And the first membrane, gas separation membrane called the prism separator. And this prism division is uh, located in uh, the St. Louis in Mis uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And they set up uh, the many installations uh, in petrochemical, ammonia installation, refining processes, starting from uh, late 70s and early uh, 80s. You can find many of their commercial plants in their websites as well. So, so I think this is the, uh, the generation three gas separation membrane concept late in the late 70s. If I would summarize what I have uh, talked about, uh, we knew that uh, the, the reverse osmosis membrane development, uh, you know, if you look at the size of the water, it's about uh, 2.8 Armstrong. If you look at the size of the ions, depending upon the type of ions, we have uh, around 6 Armstrong. So membrane separating these two will be somewhere in here, okay, around 5.5 .5 to about 6 Armstrong in, uh, in, in pore sizes or cavity sizes. If you look at the uh, gas separation membranes, size of the molecule that we will be interested is in the range of a 3 point to about the 4 Armstrong. So the membrane pore size should be much l smaller than reverse osmosis membranes. Reverse osmosis membrane modules are installed here in, uh, in California in our petrochemical complex based in Daechan or Daesan and Onsan and also in uh, Middle East, in Israel. They all can separate the seawater to produce the drinkable water and industrial waters. Now look at this, the all kinds of modules are made of spider wand or hollow fiber systems. Now, gas separation membrane should be, should have much a little smaller uh, cavity sizes than the uh, reverse osmosis membranes. But you look at the picture, it is widely used in airplane, inoting system, or big system, you know, natural gas refining and other processes. Now, we have a generation two, generation three, but I think you have already talked about the microfiltration and ultrafiltration, which has a little, much is larger in pore sizes okay, and has been widely used in many cases uh, for virus separation and bacteria separations. What about the generation four? What about the next membranes other than these generations up to three? And Professor Chorus, you know, Bill Chorus, and here, about, uh, about, about 15 months ago, present this slide. And I remember that uh, you know, uh, one of our membrane could be a generation four, along with their membrane called the, uh, the carbon membranes. And what, they, what he has uh, proposed was that cost, we, uh, we need the membrane with a pretty high performance, but uh, the, uh, the cost will be much more expensive. So. But if I have a membrane with the uh, reasonable cost and high performance than the conventional uh, membrane, then this might be uh, one of the targets. So he proposed many of the other things and I'll just skip and we may have some other chance to talk about in more details. And uh, TL membrane will be one of the processes and we can make a TL membrane out of this uh, quenching bath and so on. Uh, in, in Korea, I think we have, uh, uh, you know, this is the brief history of membrane technology in Korea. We started from uh, 60s, uh, 50s, 70s, and right now I think there is a much more advanced you know, developments in Korea. We have a membrane society formed in uh, 1988, and, uh, and there, there has been a lot of uh, group in, uh, in membrane area uh, for the developments. Just to skip this. I have a few slides, uh, two or three slides. Uh, 
So if I wanted to separate the uh, CO2 from nitrogen, I may have uh, some kind of uh, membrane with the KFT sizes between these two if the diffusivity is controlling. If I have a uh, selectivity, solution, uh, solubility is controlling, then that's a different story. But if I have a membrane with a decent size of the cavities, then I can separate these two. Okay? So uh, if I have a pore, pore size ranging from 2.8 to about 3 Armstrong, size of the, uh, the CO2 separation from nitrogen is a little difficult because size of my pore, membrane pore, is much smaller. So what I can do is that I have to push them at high pressure, okay? For example, 10 bar or 20 bar, then uh, some of the molecules with a little smaller size will, uh, will, uh, will absorb and uh, diffuse and dissolve, okay? So the diffusion, solution diffusion me me membrane mechanism will be prevailing at high pressure, okay? But if I have a requirement for the low pressure, in just in the case of CO2 capture, then I ha may have a little bit of a little, bit of a little larger cavity sizes, and I may have a just right cavity size, just like a TL membrane that we have just developed. So uh, we will talk about this. And in the case of CO2 recovery from the uh, power plant, and this will be a, a very um, important gas molecule for uh, the global warming. And uh, 5,000 coal-fired coal power plants in the world produces about 10 billion tons of CO2 per year. And that causes a lot of problems. That's what we think. And we need to reduce the number of uh, the, uh, the CO2 production or CO2 uh, generation. Uh, or we can capture the CO2 and can convert the CO2 to a, 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 a the nice material or, the, uh, or can utilize in industry. And uh, we, you know, to separate these materials, uh, to separate this for uh, post-combustion, we need the new membrane design and concepts. Uh, and CO2 and nitrogen is very important gas molecules for post-combustion, whereas uh, pre-combustion, we need hydrogen and the CO2 at high pressure and high temperature. So the uh, temperature and the pressure is different from pre-combustion to post-combustion. Post-combustion requires low pressure and low temperature. Low pressure uh, around the 0.3 bar, or uh, in other words, in absolute bar, it's about 1.3. And so we need the only small, the low pressure for post-combustion, whereas uh, you have intrinsic, uh, intrinsically high pressure and high temperature. So you can utilize those. Uh, the, no, conditions for your separation purpose. So with that, uh, I think I have elaborated a little bit about the history of uh, mm, auto membrane and gas separation membranes, particularly the commercially available membrane systems.